Hello everyone, I'm John Higgins, contributing writer to Film and TV Now and the curator of the Facebook page, John Higgins Film Review. And it is my pleasure to welcome one and all to this interview special with writer-director Chris Green, the filmmaker behind the new coming-of-age mod-themed road trip drama, The Pebble and the Boy. It is the story of John, played by Patrick Nattanani, whose mod father has recently passed and bequeaths him his old Lambretta scooter, which he uses to take his ashes to the home of mods and rockers history, Brighton. Chris, a warm welcome to you. I want to Good morning, start John. from um, what was the actual start off point for the film? Uh, well, it was about 11 years ago. It's been a long journey. Um, I, I went to Cork with my wife to see Paul Weller do a gig. And the following morning, I, I had a feeling that I'd bump into him. Uh, and I did. And I, I had a selfie with him and a quick chat with him. And then on the way home, um, on the flight, I just started to develop this this idea based on the song, the, the Pebble and the Boy, which I'd been listening to a lot um, prior to going to the gig because it resonated with me and, and like my dad and stuff like that. So, yeah, on the, on the plane on the way home uh, back to Manchester, I just started to picture this kid whose dad may have been a mod and the relationship that they had. And, that, and this kid was stood on the beach with this urn of ashes. Um, and then I started working backwards. So how did he get there? You know, and that's where the story uh, developed from, really. Okay. So obviously, the next thing is there's a dedication at the end of the film, which I noticed. I mean, could you tell us yeah. more about the person that you've dedicated the film to? Um, that's my wife's cousin Lee. Um, he passed away really suddenly about eleven months ago, and she was um, very close to Lee. She was almost they were almost like brother and sister. I spent that much time together, and Lee was a, a big fan of the jam. Um, growing up uh, and he was looking forward to coming and seeing the film when it was released you know we talked about it but yeah unfortunately Lee passed away so that dedication is is to him and his family okay um, you've just you mentioned just before we went on um, but that you were a mod I mean obviously what are your reflections on the rivalries and energies from both the 1960s and the 1980s because what was interesting was when Quadrophenia first came out in 79 my brother really lapped his up I mean I I sort of came to it on VHS I do remember yeah. the, the original Brent Walker poster when I saw that poster in adverts when I was growing up, I'm thinking, what is that? It's a quadrophenia way of life. I mean, what are your own reflections on that period? And what was it, what was it about it that kind of made you feel a part of it? Well, I came to it a little bit later because I was younger than, um, than my peers. So, so, so I had no real awareness of quadrophenia, well, not quadrophenia, but of the 60s mods. You know, I was, too, I was born in 67, so it more or less passed me by. But like your brother, I came to it in like 79, 80 through Quadrophenia and mainly through the jam. Um, and Paul Weller was, you know, he, he looked smart and, that, you know, I wanted to know more about him and how he dressed. And the older boys in my school were mods. And so I tagged along with them and they bought two-tone suits, Narrington jackets, they all wore parkas. And I think because I wanted to grow up a little bit quicker. You know, when we're teenagers, we just want to be older. We want to be old enough to go in the pub. We want, we want enough to go out on our own. And I, and I just tagged along with them and I learned from them. And, I, you know, and I started saving money up from, from the paper round to go to, to buy clothes. So I would fit in with them and be accepted by them. And then, you know, subsequently we were this little subculture within our, within our own school. Um, other people were into Brian Ferry and, and all sorts of stuff and punk and what have you. Um, and then I started going to the gigs and then that's when it really took off for me. I think my first gig was in 80, 81, seeing the jam. Um, and then that's it. Yeah, I was a, a full blown mod for a few years. Yeah. I mean, I do remember the jam at Bingley Hall. That was one of the seminal gigs. And I do remember how significant it was because like with the police and, you know, the police and the jam were like things that kind of, burn bright for a short time and then literally sort of decide, I mean, Paul Weller, as you know, has probably refused every single kind of opportunity to reform the jam, even though it will probably yeah. be one of the biggest gigs. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the cast. I mean, you've got a great cast in this movie. I mean, I, um, you know, Jesse Birdsall, um, Sasha Parkinson, Patrick McNamee, who plays your protagonist, John. Um, tell us a bit more about how, what was your casting process for that? So I'd worked with um, Ricky Harnett, who plays Ronnie, before, uh, and I knew that I could call on him and that he would like it. 
Um, when I was writing the film, I always had um, Patsy Kensett in mind for Sonia because obviously Patsy was, you know, um, she was in Absolute Beginners, which was, uh, you know, based on the Colin McInnes book, which uh, was a mod film. And I thought she was fantastic in that. And I've always loved Patsy. Um, and so I approached Patsy and she was, you know, gracious enough to read it. Um, our producer, Mike Knowles, had worked with Sasha Parkinson before. They had a good relationship. And then Sasha came on and helped develop the role of Nikki. Um, you know, we, we made her even feistier. Patrick was on a BBC programme called Our Girl with Michelle Keegan and I'd worked with Michelle. Oh, right, okay. You know, the, the, she's an army medic. Yeah, so Patrick, I'm well aware Patrick, of it, yeah. yeah, Patrick was in that and I'd worked with Michelle on a previous film um, and I liked him and I, I spoke to people about Patrick and they just had nothing but praise for him, said he was a fantastic actor. We had a Zoom call, much like we're doing now. We had a good chat for an hour and then we offered him the role, uh, despite him being a Jordan and having a real, uh, a, a strong, um, well, he's, he's not a Geordie strictly, but he's, he's that area. Um, and we spent time together and he, you know, I, th I think he does a great Mancunian accent. And I think the chemistry between him and Sasha is just phenomenal on screen. They're just, uh, I think they're great. I mean, it works really well. I mean, I loved it. That was one of my favourite bits. I mean, but everybody in the film, I mean, including the scene with the, the rockers when they turned up at the pub and all that was very well. And Patsy Kensica, I think, is excellent. I mean, Absolute Beginners, again, is another movie I remember fondly from the, the early, late 80s. So let's talk a bit about your production team and um, what what was their, what were their key contributions and and who who were the big who were the big winners and people you, you could talk about there? Uh, well, for a long time, I was um, ploughing my own furrow, really, with the film and struggling to, to get it off the ground. Um, but then I, I spoke to Mike Knowles, and we'd worked on a film back in 2012 called uh, Best Laid Plans. I was the writer on that. Um, David Blair, well-known director, was the director on that, and Mike produced it. And it starred Stephen Graham and Maxine Peake and a whole host of stars. And that's where our relationship formed. So I went back to him when I was uh, uh, splashing about in the water and getting nowhere and just said, Mike, you know, we need to move this forward. I've already put this in place. Uh, and he came on board and, you know, me and Mike are, are friends as well as partners now in, um, you know, he has his own company. But yeah, between the two of us, a combination of um, bloody mindedness and, uh, <laughs> and some skill, we managed to pull a great team around us to, to, to make the film for essentially what is the micro, micro budget film. Well, it was an excellent thing. Um, you know, I think you, Thank you. it's a testament that it works really well. And I, I mean, this is it. I mean, I don't worry so much about the budget because I want the story to be told in the way it does. And this one has such a great energy to it. And, and it's a testament that everybody, you know, be it your editing, be it your soundtrack, the sound mix is excellent and good as well. Yeah. Um, so just, I mean, obviously you shot in Brighton, but where else did you shoot? Just two locations, so um, Manchester and Brighton. Uh, anything that looks a lot as though it's along the way to Brighton is probably on the outskirts of Manchester. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> and, that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's one of the things I wish we could have done a bit more of because we're such a low-budget film. I wish we could have done you know, more drone shots of the scooters riding and stuff like that, You know, give it that... That, that vista and that production value. But I think, I do think we are punching above our weight in yeah. terms of how the film looks. And our, our DOP, Max Williams, is an absolute genius. Um, but I also think that it didn't matter because ultimately it is about the characters. It's not about the locations. I mean, you do get these spectacular, you know, you do get often in films, you get people shooting a, a really nice, beautiful shot. And then you just think, well, is it essential? And the thing is, there's yeah, that true. scene in that scene where um, where John, Nicky, and Logan all stop in the field. I thought, well, that's that's fine. I mean, it was. I mean, you've mentioned. That. So let's talk a little bit about Paul and Nicky Weller because they're in the credits. I mean, and yeah. obviously you've mentioned about Paul Weller earlier on, and he his his kind of um, presence is right up to the very end of the movie. So how did you get them on board? So. After meeting Paul, you know, he was the inspiration for the film. And uh, Paul was one of the inspirations for me actually becoming a writer. Um, people like Paul Weller and, and Morissette actually got me started to write uh, and stuff. Um, 
I'm very lucky in that I know a chap called Den Davis um, who runs a company called About the Young Idea with Nikki Weller. And they've done two massive jam uh, memorabilia exhibitions. Um, and they're also friendly with um, a wonderful musician. I'll get it out in a minute. Musician called Aziz Ibrahim. So Aziz has played with Simply Red, Stone Roses, all the, you know, lots, lots and lots of people. Um, and Aziz was on Paul's album. Um, did, they did out, he worked on Paul's album. Um, so really friendly with Paul. And it was just a case of saying, I'd like to get in touch with Paul Weller. And Aziz went through his phone and went, do you want Paul's number or do you want his assistant's number? And I was like, wow. So yeah, I spoke to Paul's um, team, told them about the idea for the film. They said, you know, it sounds cool. Send us some stuff over. We did, they liked it. And Paul said he was support supportive for the project. And then that gave me the incentive to move on and the confidence to say to people, look, we've got this film. We've got Paul Weller's music, um, you know, back us and, and get and get involved. Um, and Nikki was just, Nikki's just been brilliant. Nikki's just been a fantastic conduit between the production and Paul when we're asking for favours and we're talking about music. Um, yeah, it's just been fantastic. The whole, the whole family have been really good. Um, so let's talk about the soundtrack. I mean, it's it's fantastic. I mean, I I love the fact that you um, you know, that kind of energy, particularly in that scene in the house with um with Patsy Kentick where they where yeah. they turn that thing and you you really hit the thing. And then of course there's that scene there later on where there's one song where they all dance in Brighton. Um, how did you I mean, obviously you've mentioned that you're a micro budget film. I mean, how did you manage to get the you know, the soundtrack for this, because obviously there's acknowledgements in the credits and, you know, what was your, in terms of the song choices? I mean, what were, what were the key challenges? Well, the challenges was being able to get the music in the first place, which was massive. I mean, we've got four Paul Weller songs in a, a low budget independent British movie. It's unheard of, you know, this is, this is, this isn't Billy Elliot. We're not paying, you know, a million pound for Town Car Malice or whatever. Um, but, you know, we had to pay money. Um, but with having that relationship and that connection, it, it it was a lot easier. We did take some chances. You know, I shot that scene in the bar in Brighton with them all dancing and mouthing the words to Saturday's Kids by the Jam. And we didn't know if we had that song at the time. So, yeah, there was some, there was some you know, some sleepless nights and some gambling going on. But not just Paul Weller, but the chords, Secret Affair, uh, Electric Stars, which are a new mod band. Um, just just people wanting to get involved and people wanting to have the music in the film because they recognise that, or so they say, that this film is like something that's been, people have been looking forward to for a long time. There's not been something since Quadrophenia. Um, yeah, just massively supportive. Um, and I feel absolutely blessed for the soundtrack that we've got. It's phenomenal. So obviously, can, where where can people get that soundtrack? Is it available? Is it on Amazon? What where where can we get it? Um, there's no official. There's no plans for it to be released as a soundtrack as yet. Um, I don't know whether we'd be pushing our luck to try and do that because of the the different you know Universal Music and people like that. If the film is a success, then that could that that story might change in six months time. We might be looking at doing this, releasing a soundtrack. Yeah. If, you know, the film's successful I, at yeah. the moment, it's, it's a Spotify. It's a oh, Spotify. God. I, I mean, to be honest <laughs> with you, I think it'll be, a, it'll be such a sin if you don't get it out there. Cause I think this is, I think this will be like the blues brothers, which actually had the effect of actually getting that film <laughs> about on BHS. So obviously we, we must talk about the, you know, the influence of Quadrophenia because I mean, again, Quadrophenia Alley, which is immortalized. I mean, obviously, there's a there's a wonderful exchange between Nikki and John. It's a nod. Yeah, he says I'm not I'm not going I'm not going down a bloody alleyway and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so obviously we must talk about how influ I mean how big an influence is this film and album to you? I mean aside from what it's done with this film, what well, what are the key things that what what stands um, out for the film and album? Would it surprise you, John, if I said it that Quadrophenia wasn't a massive influence? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, by, be, by virtue of what it is, it is an influence. Um, I love Quadrophenia, the film. When when I went to see it in about 1980, you know, we come out of that, that's, that picture house stomping around in our park because I wanted a scooter, but I was, you know, too young for one. Um, it's an influence in that I know that there's um, a lot of mods still out there who like that film. Um, 
And yeah, it is an influence, but what I set out to do was make a film, albeit about mods and that scene, it's a reflective film, more nostalgic, and to try and stay as far away from Quadrophenia as possible because I didn't want the comparisons because I didn't know how the film was going to be received. And, you know, you don't want you don't want the comments to be like, oh, it's a pale imitation of Quadrophenia. So there are similarities in that there's Parkers and Scooters and Brighton, but I think the story is significantly different and I hope that people will recognise that. But, yeah, the, the album was an influence, definitely, and um, I've got the album, I've got the original. Um, it's just a superb album from start to finish, you know. The Who were fantastic, you know. And that film, Frank Rodden, what he did at the time, with the budget that they had and how they took over Eastbourne and Brighton. Yeah, it is, you know, it's brilliant. And it is one of my favourite films because it's a British subculture film. So, yeah, there is an inspiration, but I think, yeah, we did try and stay away from it as much as we could, apart from that little nod that you've mentioned. Okay. Well, but it's, it's one of those, um, if you know, you know. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I don't believe for a minute this film will this film will stand on its own because I think it's like Dirty Dancing or something like that or Saturday Night Fever. These are movies where, although yeah, they yeah. are... Dirty Dancing might be about the Catskills and the and the holiday camp. Saturday Night Fever is about, you know, it's about disco, but ultimately there's much more to that story than there is, and there is much more to this Absolutely. story. And again, there are some interesting subversions that I won't reveal here. Um, so <laughs> I, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about your crowdfunding. And I mean, obviously, um, you know, in terms of raising money, I mean, what advice would you give other independent filmmakers about this aspect of production and what should they be aiming for? If they're trying to get something off the ground, what would you advise them? Two things, really. Um, for independent filmmakers, I think the biggest one is know your audience. If you want to make a film and you want to attract whatever level of money to it, if there's no audience at the end of that film to watch it, then your investors don't get the money back and people don't invest in, don't give you another chance. So we think we know our audience. We know, you know, the mod audience um, and scooter riders and people who like the jam and Paul Weller and the Style Council. So we, we made a film to tailor to them. So that's, that's, the big, that's the big thing I would say to any, any independent filmmakers. In terms of crowdfunding, don't try and raise it all on crowdfunding. Um, we... Back in the day, we raised 10 grand, I think it was, and we went out and shot a short 20-minute promo film. Um, my advice would be shoot a little short promo, get some money together, some friends and some actors, shoot a short promo, and then use that to take to finances and try and get the full money required for the film. I wouldn't go all out um, and try and crowdfund a feature film. I don't think it works in the UK. It works in America if you've got a big name, uh, but I don't think it works in the UK. OK, um, this is a coming of age film. Um, and yeah. I just wanted to know, obviously, when you're looking at what you plan to do for the future, dependence on how the pebble and the boy does. I mean, I think this is going to do really well. I think it's got, um, you know, Thanks, the interesting what happens. Um, but what issues and themes are you keen to explore in future work? Well, what I found that, that I like, I mean, I've done like little bits of gangster stuff and, and what have you. But for me, it's nostalgia and music um, and feel good films. You know, we've just come through a, a global, well, we're still in a global pandemic. I don't want to make films with guns and people getting murdered left, right and center. Uh, I want to make films that are inspired by nostalgia. So uh, my next film is Thick as Thieves. It's set at the height of Britpop in 1995. So we're hoping for a great soundtrack, lots of great clothes in it. You know, it's a, there's a subculture involved. Um, yeah, uh, and, and music inspired as well. And for, I'm making films for audiences round about my age, you know, men and women in the late 40s, 50s, um, who want to maybe look back, maybe through rose tinted glasses on their youth um, and help people just reflect on that and, you know, and feel good about watching a film and have a good time and not have to worry about, you know, people getting shot and what have you. Well, I do think that's actually, um, that's a common thing with a lot of these movies. I mean, Eleanor Bergstein, when she wrote Dirty Dancing, wanted to reflect on the time. I mean, you had John Hughes, for example, who, again, what was yeah. funny was he said in an interview um, years ago, I think it was about 1988, um, that he said that he actually felt that high school was not really his big thing, even though he became like such an iconic writer. 
Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I think that would be fantastic. I look forward to that because obviously, I mean, the Oasis Nebworth 1996 concerts are about to be released on, you know, there's a special big stock, big event happening shortly. Yeah. So my final question before we leave you, Chris, is what are you most yes, proud of about um, the Pebble and the Boy? Wow. I, I think just finishing it, you know, it's, it's been over 10 years. Uh, we were COVID interrupted. You know, we uh, we faced some massive obstacles from locations to securing cast to finding money. So just actually making it. Uh, and then on Friday, you know, seeing it on the big screen for the first time in Brighton, I think I'll be able to relax a little bit um, knowing that it, I've done I think there's a famous quote, isn't it, about films? They don't get finished, they just get abandoned. Yeah. Um, and at some point, you know, you have to just release it to the public. I'm going to be nervous because obviously all the reviews are going to come out on Friday. Um, but things are going well at the moment. The People seem to like the film. They like the trailer. We've got a nice reception. Um, it's a film that knows what it is. You know, we're not trying to be a Hollywood blockbuster. Um, it's a, a little film, uh, we're hopefully with a, with a big heart. So... Yeah, just getting it done, John. And getting yeah. to meet good people like yourself yeah. who've watched well, it and um, say nice well, things. Well, all, all I will say, Chris, is I don't think you've got anything to worry about. And I would not oh, worry you. so much about what happens on Friday. I think the thing about it is, is this is a movie that I think will start growing in all kinds of things. I think if you can get Thank the you. soundtrack out, that'd be fantastic. I don't think you've got anything to worry about. I think, you know, I think people will go into it expecting another Quadrophenia. But again, when they see it, as I did, I mean, there were times where um, I think what was interesting was there were moments where I think, well, OK, you get, you know, you 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 get the sense of the journey. But then all of a sudden you think, well, what else? And you're, you're actually keen to know what happens next. And then oh, of course, we have a variety of revelations. So that's the interesting thing is that, again, it doesn't kind of you've structured it very subtly. And I think this is what if people will buy into that a lot more. And again, you get, um, you know, it's a celebration of, you know, modern quadrophenia, yeah. but also it's a form of its own. Chris. Absolutely. Anyway, Chris, thank you so, so much for your insights and times today. Um, the Pebble and the Boy for every everybody else is in UK cinemas from Friday, August 27th, 2021, in time for the bank holiday. Um, support just in time. Film, yeah, just in time. Support yeah. filmmakers like Chris. Support can cinemas as they continue to reopen after the challenges of the last 18 months. This is a movie that you must see on the big screen. I saw it the other day and it's fantastic. There is a marked difference. Don't watch it on streaming. By all means, watch it later, but do make it a priority to watch the film in the cinemas. I think it's going out in 80, from what, I'm, what, what I was told. We're up, um, we're up to 99 cinemas now across the UK and Ireland. It's a, been a phenomenal response. That's great. And um, as Chris said, there's been a really great reception so far. Um, he's looking forward to what how people are going to do for it. So again, support independent cinemas. Keep safe and we look forward to welcoming you to another interview special soon. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you, John. I really appreciate your time and the feedback on the film. It makes a, it makes a lot of difference to me, honestly. I really appreciate it. You're most welcome. It. You're most welcome.